And firstly, thank you everyone for coming this evening. Um, and uh, so I'm delighted to welcome Gerard Byrne um, to the RCA for the sec second lecture in the RCA Visual Cultures series around the theme of current modes of artistic production. Gerard Byrne works with photography, video, and live art. In 2007, he represented Ireland in the Venice Biennale. Other major presentations of his work include Biennales of Guangzhou and Sydney in 2008, Lyon in 2007, the Tate Triennial in 2006, and the Istanbul Biennale in 2003. Solo exhibitions of his work have been presented most recently at the Whitechapel Gallery early this year, and in 2008 at the ICA Boston and the Staatens Kunstmuseum Copenhagen. Also, he has had solo shows at Dusseldorf Kunstverein, the Charles H. Scott Gallery Vancouver, the Frankfurter Kunstverein, and the Douglas Hyde Gallery Dublin. In 2006, he was recipient of the Paul Hamlin Award. He is represented by Lisson Gallery, London. Jared Byrne's work explores the ambiguities inherent in historicizing the legacy of cultural forms from theater to photography or to magazines, all of which have traditionally been accorded the role of representing society to itself. His photographic projects are generally characterized as historical site-related projects made over several years. His film video projects involve reconstructing particular historically charged conversations originally published in popular magazines from the 1960s to the 1980s with the intention of testing the cultural present of the gallery space against the present evoked in the magazine article from the recent past. Byrne has worked on a number of projects with actors and sets in gallery spaces that test the nominal historical distinctions between sculpture and set design, acting and non-acting, and spectacle and spectator, an approach that has developed out of his conceptual interest in acting and theatre as cultural forms. Byrne's investigations encompass the idea of objecthood as applied to the human body through the changing politics around sex and sexuality and to the art object through the evolving discourse around its production and display. He is interested in how information, in the form of the written word, can have a resonance beyond its original context and meaning. Drawing from a diverse range of sources, including plays, magazine interviews, and art journals, Byrne explores how historical documents can be reconsidered in the present moment. While the restation of text is a key aspect of Jared Byrne's work, the representation of time also plays an important role and is investigated in Byrne's practice, not only in terms of its linearity, but also how it can become complex and multi-layered. In each of his works, through devices such as reinterpretation, translation, and restaging, the present moment is overlaid with the recent lived past. This device becomes explicit through the costuming and props in Byrne's moving image works. Gerard here has chosen to focus on one work titled A Thing is a Whole in a Thing It Is Not, a work originally commissioned by the Renaissance Society, Glasgow International, Lismore Castle Arts and the Van Abbey Museum. This multi-screen installation was recently part of his show at the Whitechapel Gallery. A Thing is a Whole in a Thing It Is Not borrows its title from a statement by Carl Andre and restages seminal debates from the 1960s around the significance of minimalism as a newly emerging art form. In this work and across his practice, Byrne references and tests Michael Fried's infamous critique of minimalism's theatricality in his 1967 essay, Art and Objecthood. I'll finish my introduction with a short quote from a rare interview with the elusive Carl Andre that appeared in the New York Times in 2011 regarding his then proposed show at DIA 2013. Andre concludes his three hour interview by saying, I can't really experience a thing until I've experienced it. On that note, please welcome Jared Byrne and experience his lecture on a thing as a whole in a thing it is not. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, uh, very comprehensive introduction. Uh, so, um, so uh, it was, it's a, a um, the invitation here um, is nice because it's quite specific. Um, the invitation to focus on 
one particular work is uh, is rare, um, and um, for me, it's it's uh, it's interesting because it was interesting to firstly go through a process of choosing a work um, to focus on and to and think about what sort of um, um, criteria come to bear in that situation. And I think I've zoned in on the work, a thing as a whole, and a thing it is not, because uh, I think it's an interesting point. Uh, it's, it was the process of making the work was the process of working through um, certain issues that had been raised by previous projects, and also issues that I felt um, some urgency around in terms of um, ideas around the gallery space and about uh, why you would bother to work in a gallery space. Um, so hopefully uh, I'm going to touch on some of those issues here. Uh, the format is basically um, a little bit borrowed from, uh, well, most directly from the format of the work itself, uh, thing as a whole, but also uh, the format for that work owes a debt in a way to uh, some ideas from minimalism, um, in particular the idea of modularity. So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to dip in and out of showing sections of the of the work and I'm going to speak for sections in between and it's going to be quite modular and in some ways um, quite uh, maybe a little non-linear and um, and we leave we leave conclusions maybe for another time <laughs> um, so I'm going to start though uh, with a sort of um, linear beginning uh, I'm going to start with um, um, I'm going to start with uh, um, a prehistory, in a way, of the work. Um, and the prehistory is selective, but it's, um, uh, it starts with a project that I've shown quite a lot um, called 1984 and Beyond, which in a way is emblematic of a whole um, strain in my practice, and also in a way of a period in, in terms of what I've done, a uh, period of time. Um, uh, part of the reason I chose this work as a, as a beginning point is because I have a sense that it's quite well known in London. Uh, I showed it in Whitechapel, but previously it had been shown uh, about two years ago in Tate, Britain, for a, I think for a year, basically, uh, in one of their kind of collection shows. So, so I, I got the sense that a lot of people saw it somehow in Tate, Britain. Um, and um, 1984 and beyond, uh, I won't go into great detail about it in its own right. Uh, it's one of these series of projects that I've made intermittently over the years that uh, takes as its starting point a kind of referent in, in the sort of detritus of, of, of a media sphere and of popular culture. Usually the sources have been magazines, occasionally newspapers very occasionally other types of sources, non-print media, but, um, but mostly print media. Um, in, in this case, it was um, one of a series of, the, the source was an article from Playboy magazine from 1963, um, a roundtable discussion amongst a group of um, science fiction writers in which they pondered what the world would be like in the future, uh, the euphemism being 1984 and beyond. Um, and um, this is just an installation shot, which uh, is normally installation shots can be kind of incidental. Uh, but I think in, the, in this context of this talk tonight, there are, they have some significance in the sense that apart from anything else, what's pictured is some, is some ideas about how you engage with these works in time, right? There's some sort of inference about how you would go about engaging with this work um, within the time space uh, of the gallery, um, just implicit in the furniture itself and the kind of clunkiness of its configuration. Um, and there's always a kind of quality, there was always a kind of um, an attitude in the presentation of these types of works that they should appear um, um, apart from this kind of like palpable kind of um, temporal commitment that they seem to demand, um, 
there's always this sense that you know when you look at a work on monitors you're in the same space you're in the same light as everything else in the world and you could just as well be doing something else right uh, so there's a sense like very conspicuously of giving your time over to this situation it doesn't have the sort of immersive um, character you might say of the kind of classical idea of the cinema right um, and so in that sense I suppose there's also a sort of Brechtian kind of doubling involved um, so thing as a whole is installed or not sorry 1984 is installed in this manner as our other works and the core element to it is a is a video reenactment of this text which I made with actors, uh, theatre actors in Holland. Um, I'm going to show a little clip of it simply for the sake of uh, the people here who mightn't have any idea what I'm talking about. Um, but it's, uh, it's the work combines um, video on monitors plus some other elements, photographs, a freeze of 20 photographs, uh, that I've subsequently added to, not in the form of that project, but in a subsequent project that develops out of this. Um, and I'm going to come back to these photographs. Oops, sorry, I've got a small technical hitch here. Hang on. I seem to have lost one of my... one of my clips. I'm just going to escape out of this for a second. I don't know what I'm going to do. If you'll bear with me, I'm just going to play it from here. Well, uh, how soon do you estimate that manned bases, Russian or American, will be established on the moon? And how long afterwards on Mars and Venus? The generally accepted time scale is moon 1970, Mars and Venus 1980. Well, I'll be very much surprised if these figures are more than five years off will be establishing temporary scientific bases on the moon around 1975. I think we can visualize permanent bases around 1980. These will lead to permanent colonies as soon as we've perfected techniques for extracting air and water and possibly other essentials from the lunar rocks. I suggested in my book, Prelude to Space, that the low lunar gravity may be invaluable for many forms of therapy. It may even be that men will live much longer under low gravity. If so, one can foresee quite a rush to the moon, gentlemen. <laughs> How much will it cost to finance a, a, a lunar or interplanetary voyage? Millions. 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 At first, while we uh, rely to continue on chemical fuels, it will drop to millions when nuclear propulsion or iron or plasma jets are perfected. Well, the, the, the time will come when we can put a pound into orbit for 10 cents. Okay. Well, well, by using cheap fuels like kerosene, we will be able to put people on the moon so cheaply that it will cost less to rocket to the moon than it's now to fly to... Australia. <laughs> it's the simpler engineering problem. Our children will doubtless be able to buy a ticket to the moon on a civilian ship. And it's quite likely that the process will be as simple as buying an airline seat today. Mm -hmm. The turmoil cost, I think, will likely be a fraction of present airline fares. Okay, right now, we are very impressed 
with the hardware and investment involved in extending our concept of what belongs to man. As if the moon were the seven cities of Cybola rather than just another chunk of real estate. Yeah. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I think this all will pass at about the same time the lunar communities acquire tax assessors. Whatever it will cost to get there, only one thing will be found on the moon or anywhere else in space that's truly valuable in an exploitive sense, and that commodity, gentlemen, is knowledge. Mm. This, is, this is valuable forever. <laughs> I don't disagree with you on finding knowledge here, but I think we are going to find something else that's, that's more immediately important to a human being. We are going to find a lot of real estate, and we are going to find an awful lot of raw materials. Mm. The human animal can live and create a high standard of living any place where he's got power and mass. Well, with all that real estate and all that knowledge, Another factor will come into human affairs, which has been out of it for some time. Any outlawed sect or political minority, any discontented group which doesn't like the way things are done here, will be able to pick itself up and go into the universe like the Mormons did in our West. So I would like to amplify that. We are going to split off into a minority who travel into space. People who are smart, able, healthy, fast on their feet. The, the ordinary run of Joes will just stay where they are. And, and the human race is going to spread out through the universe with this Darwinian elite. A type of human being who probably won't even interbreed with those back on Earth. As has always been the case in the past, those who feel restricted and repressed within their communities and those who find no peace at home will be those who go faring outward. And so they go out. Yesterday they became seafarers. Today they become spacefarers. Tomorrow, starfarers. What will stay behind, as always, is the happy remnant. Those content to put their life cards in a slot and have their homes, jobs, mates and offspring delivered to them in a polystyrene package. In their little colonies of contentment, uh, they will cultivate the static arts, those back on Earth. They will bring a great many crafts and entertainments to a high point of refinement. Those who leave, meanwhile, will have no victory except the contemplation of their next defeat. But they will be the winners. The contented ones, those who stay behind, will be the losers. I think, gentlemen, that we earthbound men, we've had it. The next century belongs to the spacefarers. So, um, let me just go back to my PowerPoint. So, um, you can see the constellation of, of elements that make up the work in the installation shots. Uh, I mean, when I made the work, and it was, you know, very positively received, which is always, you know, uh, encouraging. Uh, but, um, but there were certain aspects of it that were tricky. Um, one was that there's a very easy read. I wanted to show video, uh, some video clips, because there's a very easy read of the work, which is a very hindsight perspective that, uh, that reads the material as, um, as naive, right? As the original conversation was somehow naive and misguided and they got it all wrong. In fact, they got a lot of stuff right if you read it quite closely. Uh, but, um, but what was interesting, well, of course, what emerged is this sense of like, you know, in the viewers, this sense of like uh, imposing a kind of um, historical distance on the material and imposing this historical hindsight of um, or this privilege of historical hindsight onto their engagement with the work. Uh, so there's a sort of imposition of a type of temporality onto the encounter with the work. And the work actually struggles with that because, this work struggles with that because basically if you read the text, the gist of the text, if you boil it all down to one sentence, uh, and it's a very long text that this, this work is based on, uh, but the gist of it is basically that in the future the world will be different, right? 
That's essentially what it boils down to. Um, and and then the the gist of the of the viewer response was essentially kind of how off they were in the past, right? So therefore, you know, there's a sense of kind of 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 a, of historical shift, right? There's a sense implied in both those perspectives of historical shift and change. And then these photographs, which I wanted to come back to, this is just a few JPEGs from the this long sequence of images uh, that are part of the work. The point of the photographs, on some level, uh, these are all contemporary photographs. Uh, there's a big series of them. These are just some rep a representative sample, but they're contemporary photographs. Uh, there's no staging or manipulation involved in their production. Uh, they're, pr they're shot and printed in a very orthodox way uh, using you know, contemporary materials. Um, they're shot on film, but it's film you can buy today. Um, and, um, and there's an idea that's, I don't know why this keeps happening. There's no, <laughs> there's no soundtrack on this image. There's an idea, um, uh, there's an idea uh, implicit in this series of photographs, which is that on some level, if they evidence the world that these writers were speculating about, uh, then the evidence you would, then the conclusion you would draw from this evidence is that the world today looks more or less exactly as it did in 1963, uh, when more or less exactly as it did in 1963 when, when the original conversation took place. Um, and so there's a sort of temporal collapse. Um, now, that in a way, that sort of, those questions of temporality formed a kind of a, a framework within which Thing as a Whole was developing. As I was making this work, Thing as a Whole was already developing. In fact, I started to, the Thing as a Whole had as this kind of trigger point an essay that I read by um, a British art historian, Alex Potts. He's based in the US, um, somewhere in the Midwest. A very interesting essay that he wrote um, about 10 years ago um, about the relationship between minimalism and its photographic documentation. And essentially, he characterized a kind of contested relationship there in the 60s. So a lot of the minimalist artists, people like Andre, had a very antagonistic relationship with photography and a very antagonistic relationship with the idea that their works could be photographed and could circulate somehow photographically in a way that was um, dangerous, that would appear dangerously adequate, you might say. Um, and. And that was a very, it's a very interesting uh, text um, because, of course, it seems so foreign on some level, yeah, you know, to our contemporary perspective. Um, and, um, uh, but, but, um, but what was also interesting about it was that implicit in, in the text is a kind of a, an opening out of questions around how the photo, how the work, how the sculptural work inhabits the photographic space. And how the photo, how the camera renders that space and the and the work within it, um, and how all this is bound up with the temporality of a photograph. Um, so these were the kind of contexts that essay and this work were the sort of context for for the thing as a whole project. Um, now I'll move forward. Actually, again, I've lost my clip. That's what it is, is it? When I was teaching at Cooper Union in the first year or two of the 50s, someone told me how to get off to the unfinished New Jersey Turnpike. Took three students and drove from somewhere in the meadows to uh, Brunswick. It was a dark night and there were no lights or shoulder markers, uh, lines, railings, or anything at all. Uh, except the dark pavement moving through the landscape of the flats rimmed by the hills in the distance, uh, but, but punctuated by 
stacks, towers, fumes, and colored lights. This ride was a revealing experience. The road and much of the landscape was artificial, and, and yet it couldn't be called a work of art. On the other hand, it did something for me that the that art had never done. At first, I, I didn't know what it was, and, but its effect was to liberate me from the many views I had had about art. It, it seemed that the, there had been a reality there that had not had any expression in art. The experience on the road was something mapped out, but not socially recognized. I thought to myself that, you know, to be clear, that's the end of art. So, um, thing as a whole is, uh, well, it, the simple way of characterizing its format is, uh, is a five-channel uh, video projection installation. But actually, it's quite a complicated kind of, there's quite a complicated kind of configuration of elements, which uh, I'll try and get into as we meander along. Um, uh, for me, I mean, the work takes, I, I've already described the kind of context uh, for me specifically, but in some ways, you know, I, I've, very reductively, I could kind of characterize the project, the thing as a whole project, as, a, as an attempt to think further into these questions of viewership and temporality and the gallery space that were manifest in, for example, the, the furniture that I talked about earlier in, in 1984, or the relationship, the kind of uh, somewhat like um, antagonistic relationship between the, the, the temporal perspective that the video work seemed to engender and the, and the temporal, temporality that the photographs produced. Um, so Thing as a Whole was kind of more explicitly an attempt to think about temporality in relation to, uh, to artistic concerns. And uh, it took as its, it takes as its starting point uh, minimalism, uh, very simply as has been kind of uh, characterized earlier, uh, because it, um, because in a way minimalism, in a very sort of orthodox art historical sense at least, um, seems to like uh, mark um, a significant shift uh, in terms of ideas of time in relation to the gallery space. Um, the minimalists were interested in, as I, I mentioned earlier, modularity, um, form a type of, um, they were, uh, what's the word for it? Modularity, they were interested in uh, confounding ideas of composition. They were interested in, um, uh, like the signature historical reference for the minimalists is Brancusi's Endless Column. Um, and so ideas of modularity, repetition, endlessness, uh, are very, very central kind of tropes uh, in terms of what came to be constituted as minimalism. The other thing that I think is important about minimalism uh, is that the artists themselves never identify themselves as minimalists. Uh, that's very much a kind of art historical, a production of art history. Um, and that, in a way, um, those kind of tensions are sort of acted out a little bit through this work because on some level, the, the project um, is sort of avowedly kind of art historical, you might say, in terms of its sets of references. Uh, and at the same time, there's an attempt to kind of um, work with these references in a way that's kind of purposefully sort of ignorant of art historical concerns, um, or irreverent towards art historical concerns. An idea that maybe as an artist, I was in the, I'm in the business of sort of reclaiming 
uh, some sense of um, of my own sort of ancestry uh, for artists. Um, so um, the clip that I've just shown is is you might pass it off as one of the channels of this five channel installation. Uh, I'm a little skeptical of this five channel kind of description because actually the work has a much more modular kind of dispersed form than that. But um, but this particular clip was shot on the New Jersey Turnpike outside New York um, one winter night, and uh, and of course is uh, the the images you see in some at some level literally kind of perform the voiceover that you hear. Uh, the voiceover is a direct quotation from Tony Smith, uh, who is one of the his kind of loosely grouped within the minimalist kind of. Um, group of artists. In a way, he sort of slightly predates minimalism, but kind of loosely kind of um, grouped there. He's a Kiki, Kiki Smith's father, by the way. Um, and, uh, and he had this, uh, there's this famous quote from Tony Smith from an interview uh, with Sam Wagstaff, an important curator from 60s New York, in which he talks about this um, epiphany he had while driving on this section of the unfinished New Jersey Turnpike at night with some students from Cooper Union. Um, he had this epiphany about the future of art, an epiphany, epiphany about, about a type of endlessness, a type of temporal scale that, that he hadn't seen represented in, in art of that moment in the early 60s. And that's, that's what's enacted uh, in this, in this um, uh, video clip. And it's... Um, it's one of the cardinal points in the literature around minimalism, this quotation. I'm going to show you something else now. Recently, we've been hearing a lot of talk about the evolution of a new abstraction, uh, which as yet hasn't been given any name. And uh, some of this work has been seen around in uh, exhibitions at the uh, Sidney Janis Gallery uh, in a show that's entitled The Classic Spirit in 20th Century Art. And uh, this suggests that the uh, evolution of this abstraction perhaps goes back to the early years of the 20th century, and that you can uh, find precedents for it in Malevich and Mondrian, and perhaps other constructivists or neoplasticists. Our guests tonight, uh, Dan Flavin, uh, Don Judd, and Frank Stella, uh, seem to come under this category of the so-called classic spirit. I'm not sure the term is accurate, but for want of another term, uh, perhaps we can uh, uh, use that temporarily. Other, other terms have been applied to your kind of work. Uh, I understand that there has been an editorial that, have, that appeared in a magazine just recently uh, that referred to this time uh, uh, while all this work is going on as the time of the white surface. And uh, there are two other exhibitions about that have been put on to uh, uh, illuminate uh, or some uh, points about uh, this style of art. And uh, they are an exhibition at the Hartford Museum in Connecticut and the uh, uh, Jewish Museum here in New York uh, recently closed an exhibition entitled Black and White. The uh, show up in Hartford was called Black, White, and Gray. Uh, just uh, to give a simple description of this work, the, uh, the morphology of it may be loosely characterized as um, extremely simple, sometimes with a colored surface of one hue, and when there is a design, it's often symmetrical or repeated or, or both, uh, but it's exceedingly spare. And uh, to many people, these works seem to offer a minimal plastic effect. And I thought I'd just simply start off by reading to you and asking for your comments an editorial from the recent issue of the Art Voices magazine. The editorial from the January 1964 issue says, uh, very simply, a point of saturation has been reached in abstract paintings so that a simplification in some cases, um, in some cases oversimplification of patterns seems to be emerging. Huge planes, harmonious spaces painted in subtle shades such as pale gray, off-white, purple, yellow, blue, as if we were arriving in modern painting at an era to be known as the time of the white surface, a restful trend that considerably complicates the task of critics. And it concludes with a line, we believe something ought to be done about it soon and by all concerned. Uh, Frank, do you have some uh, ideas about this? 
That was a, a that was a module, you'll say, I might say, from another section uh, of the work, uh, which is filmed in a, an old radio studio, um, and it's uh, it's based on it takes as a, as its referent another kind of cardinal point in the in the literature on minimalism, and by literature, what I mean is is the the idea this kind of this art historical project of formulating minimalism. You can see that actually the very nature of that discussion uh, that you've just heard is a, a sort of a, a skepticism towards this idea of these group shows, the formation of a movement, the categorization, um, the voices that you, the voice, the main voice you just heard there was uh, um, Bruce Glazier, who is a um, art historian and critic at the time in, the, in circa 1962. It actually dates from almost exactly the same time as the 1984 text that I t described earlier. Um, uh, but this was, th th this, uh, so the main voice you heard was Bruce Glazier. The, the other voice that you subsequently heard, the more high-pitched voice, was Frank Stella's voice. In later sections, and if we have time I can show a later section, you hear the other participants speak. 
um, Donald Judd and Dan Flavin. Um, and uh, uh, basically, what is what's well among the things that was fascinating to me about this this um, reference was that this was a the, the transcript of this conversation, an edited version of the transcript of this conversation, has been widely published. Um, but the original conversation was broadcast on WBAI radio station in New York in, I think, 62. Uh, WBAI is still going. It's a kind of independent, kind of um, lefty kind of radio station in the US. And uh, this conversation is long. It's about an hour long. And it inc goes into incredible levels of sophistication and detail. And I was always fascinated by this idea that that really nuanced, specialized, specialist conversation was just broadcast over the airwaves, right, for whoever to pick up. Um, so the, 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 the process of kind of revisiting it in the way that I've done um, involves, uh, in, uh, involved a sort of re-inhabitation, we'll say, of the moment involved the camera there's a kind of character uh, quality to the camera work which i think is important which is that um the camera work renders a type of materiality to the situation it sort of doesn't draw any distinctions between bodies and other elements in the space and it seems to it seems to float in a way that that marks a strange kind of um uh, a sort of ethereal kind of character that might reflect something about like something might somehow somehow be symmetrical with the idea of a radio broadcast, but also there's a way in which it sort of floats around this mise en scène without ever fully inhabiting it. Um, the bodies that you see um, are the bodies of they're not the bodies of the voices that you hear. Um, the 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 voices that you hear are is the are is the original recording. Um, the bodies that you see are yeah, body doubles. I don't know why, how to describe them. But I think what's significant about that is that firstly, it's a little bit of a misstep in terms of previous works that I've made and that other people make and, and ideas that we have when we look at like filmic imagery, right? We assume that there's this kind of diegesis between image and sound, right? It's a sort of a generally an assumption. But I think one of the things that's kind of enacted in this, in this material is a uh, is this kind of idea of a, a schism between image and sound that seems to echo some idea of a schism between between the images and some sense of uh, of the historical material that they reference? Um, somehow it pictures a space uh, negatively. Uh, you also have noticed that there was kind of black sections. Uh, these black sections here are just markers, actually, in these clips, but actually. What they mark is that um, when the when the all the video elements of thing as a whole are projected, there's there's moments in the in the projection when they when the projection really disappears physically disappears, because um, we went to great trouble to develop this system with a uh, with shutters that are attached to the projectors that physically block the light at certain points in a way that's not dissimilar to the way a slide projector works. You know, a slide projector has a little curtain that, that kicks in when the slides change. An old-fashioned slide projector has a little curtain that kicks in when the slides change to stop light spill uh, in the transition. Um, so we had to, we, we sort of re put together this system that uses these shutters that are synchronized to the video. So you have this kind of um, sort of quite staccato kind of presentation which um, which does different things, I think. I mean, one of the things it does is that it renders palpable the kind of image. Um, it, it makes it more material, I think, because you, you sort of feel the materiality of it when it disappears and then when it returns. And depending on how dark the space is, sometimes that can have a kind of retinal effect. Um, but also, um, also, it sort of establishes often a kind of schism between image and sound. Um, and also, it sort of affirms this idea of modularity that I've talked about. So for example, the sections that I've shown, even back to the 1984 section, they're not just kind of outtakes or cutouts, we'll say, samples from, the, from a longer edit. They, that, that's really a kind of a, a unit in terms of the way the work is structured. Um, 
So I'm going to show something else here. Uh, this is a bit of a segue, well, it's a sort of transitional moment. Uh, this is, um, this is a, actually, a, 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 it's a, it looks like it's just a text there. There's a little bit of detail lost in the, in the, in the projection. But uh, it's actually a photograph of a vinyl text on a wall uh, that's actually part of the 1984 installation again. And this is kind of a, maybe a, a kind of confessional moment as an artist where uh, often you, it, it can be sometimes quite difficult to delineate your interests into different projects. And invariably they overlap. And sometimes things get misplaced, right? So, so I, when I made the 1984 piece, uh, I included this text uh, as a vinyl text on the wall in the final installation. Uh, I'm very comfortable with it as part of the installation, but in a way, it was a moment that in a way uh, preempted more specifically the concerns, uh, or more explicitly, we'll say, the concerns of things as a whole. Um, I'll give you a second to read it. It's a pretty dense text. I don't know if I'm going to get to go into it in great detail now because it would take up the rest of the time, I think. But it's a quote from the biography of Jonathan Edwards, uh, written by Perry Miller. Um, and the quote is lifted wholesale from the beginnings of this text, Art and Objecthood, written by Michael Freed. Now, I think that's Michael Freed. He's a an art historian based in Baltimore um, in the US uh, when he was a very uh, I mean he's very active um, for decades he's worked worked on French 18th 19th century painting in in the last five or six years he's returned um, with gusto to contemporary art uh, in particular uh, in relation to working in relation to photography and the idea of the tableau um, but originally in the 60s, he's a kind of classic Greenbergian, uh, studied in Harvard, and, um, and was um, a brilliant uh, protege kind of of Greenberg, and wrote this essay, Art and Objecthood, in 1967, published in art form. Uh, and I think he was like, I don't know, 25 or something when he wrote it. Um, and it's, it was a, a critical attack on minimalism from a modernist perspective. And of course, it's, it's famed within art historical circles as being, um, even in its sort of criticism of, of minimalism, in a way it, it formed the dominant uh, terms of debate around that work. Um, and I, I, in a way, I feel a debt to, to, to this essay, a great debt to it, because in a way, because what it did is it opened out ideas of temporality in relation to minimalism and by extension, ideas of temporality in general in relation to the gallery space. And, and I think it's a reasonably tenable argument to say that uh, a lot of what's become the norm in the gallery space in terms of showing video work or even performance work uh, can be, if not sort of traced back to minimalism per se, can be traced back to the moment that minimalism kind of inhabits, right, in the early 60s. And so in that sense, you know, I think it is legitimate to say that the terms of, of his objections to minimalism, were, which were precisely around its sense of duration, uh, as opposed to the instantaneousness of, of modernist art, um, uh, I think that, that, that they've been profoundly influential in terms of opening out these questions about the relationship between the gallery space and time and inhabiting the gallery space as a viewer in time and your relationship to, to the temporality of the work in that situation. This is um, Perry Miller, who wrote the biography of Jonathan Edwards, quoted in, that, that's quoted in Art and Objecthood. And this is Jonathan Edwards, who was an 18th century American uh, theologian and intellectual. He was the first, he's considered the first great American intellectual. Uh, I think I'm gonna skip over going into detail on the text uh, but what's fascinating about the text for me and what's fascinating about it in relation to things as a whole and in relation to 1984 is that it proposes an idea. He, Edwards was, was, was fascinated by this idea of typology, 
which is a, a concept that runs, that recurs apparently time and again in the history of theology. I don't know much about theology, but uh, from what I've read, it's a kind of persistent concept, although it takes different forms at different times. And essentially, it's based around this idea that the world as we see it around us is somehow a, an iteration or an illustration or a kind of a, a direct indexical relationship with the Bible, with the Old Testament. And um, what's fascinating about that for me is that in a way it proposes a sort of model of history, or a, it's a sort of a, a, an anti-history, right? So you have this idea that the world can't evolve in a significant way because all it ever is is an image of something that's predetermined. Um, and that connects back to those small black and white photographs I showed, and it also connects back to um, some ideas about time in relation to minimalism and its position in time. There's the quote at the beginning of Art and Objecthood. I'm just going to escape out of this just for a second, just so as I can see what's next.
That's one of, uh, I'm realizing I'm running tight on time here, that's one of, uh, uh, representative of the s most significant aspect of the material that makes up these modules in the work, which is most, a lot of the material was filmed in the Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven, which was um, really, really helpful in realizing the work. We installed uh, a whole wing of the museum with, histor with works from the, minimus works from the Van Abbe collection specifically to film. Uh, the Vanaba was one of the first museums in Europe to champion minimalism. This was a publication of theirs from 68, Robert Morris. The image that you just saw was, uh, was uh, workers from the museum installing a, a nine eight shapes is the name of a work by Morris that's in their collection. This is another publication they did, Don Judd. Good graphics, right? I'll skip forward from that. That's Don Judd from the archive of the Van Abbe Museum. That's him reading his publication. Um, and the, these are some shots from the archive of the Van Abbe of Don Judd installing works. And in general, I think, I mean, I'm I'm interested in them in relation to these ideas that I set out with at the beginning around photography and around time and around the temporality of these works. Uh, I mean, I'm, I, I, I think that their position in time is very interesting. It can be quite difficult to locate them temporally. Uh, one, of the, one of the factors that I often use is a, is a relationship with um, a relationship with uh, with with post-war industrialization in the U.S. Um, I mean, for me, for me, um, as I said, the whole project is really an attempt to gather together this set of references around minimalism, which some of which are kind of orth orthodox art historical references, much of which is actually very, very uh, particular within that orthodox. is very unorthodox, I should say. Um, and and kind of use the use the kind of occasion of the gallery space of the museum space as a sort of temporal space in order to kind of um, really instrumentalizing that space as a way of interrogating that the, the the legacies of minimalism in terms of like the contemporary situation of temporality. Um, and so the work takes on. I mean, I'm gonna. I want to just jump forward as a conclusion to installation shots. Um, I'll just show you this clip just because it's quite different to most of the others you'll have seen. The work of Morris and Judd has many similarities. They both like the tension which can arise from the driklang, space, object, and spectator. All three are definite elements. The walls, of an inside area in which a work of Morris stands, for example, form as it were the boundaries of a volume wherein the object forms the hard core and the spectator the active moment. Perhaps the idea of the Drieklang is best understood if, if one imagines oneself as an outsider and a given wall of an exhibition room as transparent. The totality of the happening, a visual experience, is defined by that centrally found object, by the observing spectator, and by the limitations of the room. All minimal artists are concerned, more or less, by the Triklang. Already there's an attempt in the most recent developments to have object and space coincide. So that, that, that 
text is from a, a newspaper article from the early 70s, a review of one of these important minimalist shows in the Vanaba. Um, he uses this word three clank. I don't know what the hell it means. I don't know if he knew what it means. I think one of the one of the interesting qualities of the of of this process is uh, it's quite interesting for me anyway to look at actors who are delivering lines and you sense they they don't have any understanding of the lines they're delivering, um, and that's in a way kind of indicative of sort of bigger issues maybe. I'm just going to skip forward. Um, if I can, just as a conclusion, here's some more archival photographs from the Van Abbey Museum. And I, I wanted to show these images and then finish with some shots of thing as a whole installed. Because these images are kind of informative in terms of the, the configuration of, of my project. Um, these are actually, you might recognize, I don't know if you can recognize, we didn't show you enough work to really see it, but these are the same rooms that we installed the works in, that we filmed in. Uh, they don't look exactly the same because they, they had these beautiful linen walls at the time, uh, which they no longer have, but the whole um, kind of ceiling is exactly the same, and the sort of spatial configuration of the rooms and the scale of them is the same. Um, among the works here is, is, is in the middle, you can see these um, uh, L-beams by Robert Morris, um, kind of important, seminal work. And of course, one of the things that's fascinating about it is its sort of prop-like quality and its hollowness. So these are the terms that Freed profoundly objected to. It had no integrity as sculpture. It was hollow like a prop. And, it seemed to, and as a consequence, it seemed to infer an idea of theater. Uh, in the gallery space, which was profoundly objectionable from his modernist perspective. Um, all, all minimalist work, not just this, but this is kind of indicative of it. Um, so I'm just going to click forward now, just as a wind up, to show some images of, of how I've installed things as a whole. From in, I'm just, these are from different places. So this is, a, this is an image of a blank. I basically we build these screens. They're not really screens. They're kind of because they're quite deep. Um, these kind of uh, constructions, which in a way echo the the Morris piece, the L beams, in terms of their physical kind of construction, um, and we occasionally project onto them. Uh, I say occasionally because more often than not, there's nothing projecting. Um, you can just see, actually, in the upper uh, right corner of the image, you have a projector, and you've got a kind of black area. It's a little bit muddy there, but, but that's the sort of projection shutter closed. And when the shutters were closed in this particular installation, which is in Bard College in upstate New York, in the Hessel Museum there, uh, we had these sort of strange purple lights that switched on. It was extremely theatrical. Uh, this is the space without the purple lights. This is the same image with a, with a still projected, with a different still projected. This is a wider angle perspective. Um, and you can see that these structures just lean on one another in a very prop-like quality. Uh, they have a real physicality to them. They're also very light. Uh, they're made of different materials at different times, but often, sometimes they're made out of foam. So. This is an installation from the Renaissance Society in Chicago. Of course, for when, when these works are documented, a little bit like the kind of manipulation that the minimal is subjected to, photographers who document them always want to have like loads of images going all over the place, right? That's what's going to look good in the photograph. But it's not actually how the work looks, right? And that the work is kind of purposely meant to have a very dispersed character. And, uh, and often you're sort of left looking at, at very little, actually. Um, and, and as I say, that's, this is in the White Chapel. So maybe I'll just say, by way of a conclusion, that, um, that you know, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I think it's, I mean, maybe we'll get into it in questions, but 
Uh, I'm interested in the idea of like, how do you rationalize doing stuff in a gallery space now? Uh, there's so many uh, uh, viable alternatives. Uh, and, and I mean, there, there's of course lots of different narratives for rationalizing the gallery spaces. And I'm by no means kind of uh, claiming to make some sort of all encompassing argument. And there's different types of practices, of course, that make lots and lots of sense within a context like that. I suppose the question is put back to myself more than anything else, which is that if I'm interested in working with the, the types of agendas uh, that I apparently am interested in, then how do I recon reconcile those agendas and those imperatives uh, with the gallery space as a kind of um, as a parameter or as a space to work? And for me, it sort of boils down to an idea of uh, well, on the one hand, interrogating that space itself and interrogating its its uh, limits, as well as its um, specific kind of potential, uh, and I think that a project like this is all about that. Um, and um, uh, but also, I mean, more generally, there's 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 um, uh, there's. There's also like a kind of an idea of trying to use the gallery, figuring out ways of making it useful, you know, and using it as a kind of apparatus. And I think that goes way back in my work. I mean, if you look at uh, 1984 and the f configuration of 1984 and beyond actually is is a, only the third or fourth iteration of a type of configuration that I've been using for the best part of 10 or, well, seven or eight years before that, going back to like 2000, 2002. Um, uh, there's always been an attempt to kind of turn the, the, the gallery space into something that's conspicuous, conspicuously me, like a, a mediator, something that's in between the work and the viewer, uh, and render it conspicuous as that type of an apparatus. And, and that's on one level, you might say, a critical kind of um, undercutting of the space or certain fantasies about the space. Uh, and on another level, of course, it's an attempt to kind of reground the space. Um, and I, I suppose the general context I'm talking about is the idea that, for example, you know, there's there's film festivals, there's satellite TV, there's the internet, there's all sorts of other channels of dispersal, um, and um, and so and it's within that context that I'm I'm sort of being engaged with this preoccupation. Um, in this case, with this work, it's, it's, turned, it's partly involved quite an elaborate kind of physical configuration in the space. And there's something a little baroque about that. Uh, and there's also something that's very much about, um, that's very much about, um, yeah, making this, rendering the, the, the space very, very physical and very, very temporal in terms of how you engage with it. So maybe I'll just finish talking at that or take some questions if there's any. We have a little bit of time, I think, a few minutes. So any questions? Yeah. Um, I was wondering how you feel about... Um, Hello. Um, I was wondering how you feel about um, these installations being kind of fantasies. Um, cause that's the, uh, um, that's what I felt when I saw them, that they were, um, almost, um, my own fantasies of these people. Right. Um, just in the way that they're put together. Um, yeah. And, um, the romantic kind of focus on details. Um, yeah, and whether you... Now that's a good point, because I, 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 it's, a, it's a conspicuous point that I didn't really address in what I've said. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about the images themselves on some level, right? Why do they look the way they do? Uh, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I'm interested in the idea. I'm interested in, in I'm, I've always been phobic about that word reenactment, because it always seems to infer some sort of idea of a restoration, or mm -hmm. some sort of idea of like, that there is a sort of correct kind of uh, representation of a, of a situation, or a corrective representation. But I'm quite interested in the word enactment, mm -hmm. 
because enactment involves kind of um, involve bringing forth, we'll say, the potential that seems implicit in something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, an instance, and, and, and these images are very much about that. They're very much about kind of um, enacting kind of some sort of latent potential of these situations. So, for example, most conspicuously with the radio broadcast, I mean, the recording exists. It's out there. You can get it. It's, you know, it's not on YouTube, but you can get it. Um, and, and, of course, it was broadcast at least once. Um, but, the, but, but, of course, then what I was interested in was this kind of, um, on one level, a very literal kind of realization of it. But, but of course, that process of sort of, uh, it's almost pornographic kind of uh, historical representation. That process is, is of course, self-defeating in, invariably, right? Um, and there's times, and, and I think in what I do in the work is that there, there's times in which it's more conspicuous than others, the sort of defeat, the moment of defeat within the image. Um, but, um, but I think what's interesting to me about it is less about kind of um, some sort of idea of irony. I'm comfortable with all that, but it's not really about kind of playing to irony or something like that. What it is, is it's about kind of uh, affirming a sort of set of terms on which an image works, which uh, are not about kind of historic, being historically correct, absolutely. And they're also not about being historically ironical. Uh, it's, not, it's not commentary at that level. It's much more, and it's also not about some sort of idea of a period drama from film. So. I often work with people who work in the film business, of course, I do that to work with these things, but invariably we have these conversations about, about what's correct, you know, and they, they make all sorts of presumptions based on their experience of the grammar of filmmaking. And, and, and I just take a sort of step back from that. I kind of let it happen, but I also let, I, I let it fall apart as well. So even in the, the text, the texts are really clunky. The, the dialogue, the whenever there's dialogue, it sort of doesn't really work as dialogue, and and that's fine for what I'm doing. So, hi. Also speaking about the details, why everyone smokes? <laughs> yeah. Hey. I, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Uh, well, let's be honest. I mean, the the, the sort of the, the periods that we're referencing here, smoking is kind of uh, was kind of a, a standard kind of nervous tick kind of uh, is a kind of a standard demeanor. Um, invariably, there's a there's a there's a there's a facet of characterization that goes on because, like, it happens all the time when I make these works. People ask me for details that just don't exist, right? Whether somebody smoked or didn't. Right, I said I don't know. We just have to decide, you know. So, uh, so it's speculative on many, many levels. It's speculative, uh, and I, I, I think that's a one of the. I talked just a minute ago about limits and potential, and I think uh, you know that remains um, a real potential within artistic practice. That within limits, it can be wonderfully speculative, including about details like that. Yeah. And then thinking about the projections, obviously, with projections, you're, you're bound to be thinking yeah. about light. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. That's a big question, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, certainly there's, there's uh, I mean, on all sorts of levels, of course, that's what I'm working with, right? It's the tool, right? On some level is light. Light itself is somehow the tool. Uh, 
And it would be, uh, it's actually something I, I don't have a kind of significant response to, but I think it's a really legitimate, there's a, there's a really legitimate question in there about the materiality of light and about that as a kind of conduit, we'll say, for engaging with, with all these kind of um, questions of like historical representation. Um, one of the things that fascinated me, unfortunately I didn't get to show that much of the museum stuff, but one of the things that sort of fascinated me about the museum was there's some shots, there's some sequences that are shot, some of these modules are shot in, with the works in place in the museum uh, with no lighting. The lights are off in the museum and it's quite interesting to see them in that sense. It's also quite interesting to see them lit by just by because the, the Van Abba Museum has these kind of skylit galleries. It's quite off. I, it's quite compelling for me to see them lit by the same light as everything else in the world. Right. So just lit by daylight, filtered through these these uh, skylights. And, and, and actually, there's very, uh, I mean, as I said, it's a, the work is very, very long. There's a lot of material. I could never come close to showing um, a representative part of it. But uh, uh, it's, there's probably an hour and 20 minutes of, of material dispersed in a certain configuration of edited material. Um, but, but, um, but yeah, I'm interested in, you know, what, what becomes conspicuous is this quotidian life of these objects in the museum material. Them in daylight, them at night, with the lights going on, the lights going off. And of course, there's also a kind of very literal connection in that one of the works that's featured is a corner piece by Dan Flavin. And that somehow, you know, the work, it was always part of the work that it somehow shared the same apparatus as the museum itself, fluorescent tubes just as the museum is lit by fluorescent tubes, so the work is made from fluorescent tubes. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, my point uh, follows on from that, really. Um, there's obviously uh, a great joy in the materiality um, that you, you play with in the gallery space. Yeah. But you were talking about you know, using uh, viable alternatives to the gallery, and in a sense, you're going to lose that sort of... Um, materiality if you're using television or um, internet that's one yeah. thing and I suppose another thing is that with the gallery space comes certain uh, structures of funding which is also uh, kind of central to production yeah yeah I mean I'm, I'm I mean I maybe I maybe I miss uh, misrepresented myself I mean in general I'm totally committed to, to the gallery space my project is to is to rationalize that commitment right uh, is to figure out why I'm committed, what's useful in the commitment. Um, and um, so, um, I mean, certainly something like funding is probably not a good argument for working in the gallery space uh, because it seems to be uh, maybe more constrained than, 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 um, than it would be elsewhere in other contexts or than it could be elsewhere in other contexts. Uh, but uh, but I agree with you about the idea of materiality. What's interesting to me is, I mean, I'm, I totally acknowledge the kind of materiality. We'll say that's that's that that's possible within the space. But but maybe my, I might put the emphasis more specifically on uh, on some sense of like the the occasion of visiting the gallery, the sort of temporality of stepping off the high street into the gallery space, uh, and the types of expectations that might drive a viewer in there and, uh, and keep them there, right? And, and leave them thinking about it afterwards. Uh, I mean, on some level, it's banalities that I'm saying. On another level, I think that they're, they're increasingly, uh, increasingly kind of less, uh, um, less obvious or less kind of the default kind of mode, even of engaging with work, right? I mean, um, most people, most of the work that most people see now is probably not, you know, physically, right? They see it in reproduction, they see it on the internet, whatever, right? So, uh, and it's funny, I did this interview, for example, with, uh, we got this image from the Whitechapel, I did an interview with, with Kirsty, um, who was at the Whitechapel, Kirsty Og, um, for the publication we did there, and one of the things we talked about in the interview, which I think is interesting, was a uh, we talked about ideas of like, for example, um, like I'm sort of fascinated by the idea that uh, 
that the gallery space in some ways on the high street can is a little bit analogous to um, to like retail, right? To stores that are on the high street. It sort of occupies an adjacent space, and in many ways, increasingly, it sort of shares a kind of mode of be a mode of kind of uh, of operation. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, well, Tesco knows like everybody who walks across the threshold, right? One way or another. Uh, it still seems mostly that most gallery spaces anyway have kind of at best a kind of vague idea who kind of enters and who leaves. And, and that's, I think that's still largely the case, right? And I'm sure they're doing their best to, to kind of, um, you know, revise that. But in a way, I quite like that idea. And, and it's spoken also as an artist. You put up work, you don't really know who's going to see it, right? You have an idea, you have some vague idea, you know a few people who'll see it, but you don't know the, ma the vast majority of the people who are going to see it. And that's kind of an interesting situation. Uh, and then you get some pleasant surprises down the road. Um, so I think that there's a kind of an openness in a way. I don't want to idealize the space, but I also think we shouldn't lose sight of the mechanics of it and the specificity of it. Uh, that there's a kind of openness about who walks in and who walks out and how long they spend. And, and um, this work actually structurally in a way very, is very much a reflection on that. It doesn't have a beginning or an end. It plays in this kind of, in this uh, modular kind of manner. It's all synchronized and it plays back in this kind of very complicated manner that's, uh, it's sort of impossible to have a comprehensive view of it. Also because it's spread on multiple screens, you'd probably have to watch it for, I don't know, hours, four hours to somehow comprehensively view everything. It's not meant to be looked at like that. It's meant to be entered and left in an almost kind of, um, yeah, distracted manner or something or, you know, that in a way reflects on some of these questions. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what that means. Well, well, the, the, well, where it falls apart, we'll say, as a representation. Oh, sorry. I'm just... Yeah, just maybe you should say it again, William. <laughs> <laughs> um, just going back to the enactments, and you mentioned a phrase, the moment of defeat, and I wasn't quite sure what you were referring to. Right. Um, well, in a way, as I said, it's this sort of moment where the image falls apart, in a way, as a tenable historical representation. Uh, I don't even know if a tenable historical representation is possible, but I think I'm interested in somehow acknowledging the, the, fa the, 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 the flaws within that process. I'm interested in somehow allowing them to exist within the work. So sometimes, you know, like a good instance would be that sometimes within the same frame, within the same image, within the same couple of seconds, there's some, some sort of incommensurability between something that's in the foreground and something that's in the background. And uh, I mean, you, f you can kind of, so something that's out of place or something that somehow seems to contradict or, you know, the incommensurability of the lines that the, that the actor delivers and his body position that seems to imply in some kind of intangible but palpable way that he doesn't really understand his own words, right? So that's a kind of a very material kind of occasion. You know, that's a moment that, you know, these kind of, there's a sort of texture or a pattern or something that, that, that sort of appears. And, and as I say, you know, I work on some level with like a script, right? So you work with something that's very linear, uh, as at least as a starting point. Uh, and then on another level, of course, the script uh, plays a role but it's a little bit of a MacGuffin, right? It's a little bit of a decoy. Actually, actually, what's more interesting is some sort of sense of pattern that emerges across, you know, the structure is a pattern, basically. And that's, uh, you know, I, I could reflect that back to the minimalist concerns. You know, if you heard more of the radio interview, you'd hear that they're preoccupied with dispensing with composition. They're, they're artists who weren't interested in composition. Uh, and so, in a way, pattern becomes more interesting, maybe as an alternative to composition. So, and within this pattern, you have kind of success and failure. You have tenability and and, and untenability. 
kind of modulation between the two, back and forth, sometimes from one frame to the next. Thank you very much. I think we ran out of time now. All right. Um, <laughs> thank you, Gerard. Thanks a lot. I just want to say quickly um, that we have